Hello, everybody. I'm Nicholas Thompson. I'm the CEO of The Atlantic, and I will be your moderator today. We are going to have an incredible session. Star of the show is Nita Farahani. She is a futurist and legal ethicist at Duke. And she's so smart and so interesting. You're going to learn a ton. This is how it's going to work. We're going to watch a short video. She's going to come on stage and talk. And then we're going to do a little Q&A, questions from the audience. And that'll be a wrap. And you'll leave <laughs> enlightened and excited. So first off, a video. Uh, it's going to make you see the future and understand a wonderful future where we can use brain waves to fight crime, be more productive, and find love. Let's roll. You're in the zone. Even you can't believe how productive you've been. Your memo is finished, your inbox is under control, and you're feeling sharper than you have in a decade. Sensing your joy, your playlist shifts to your favorite song, sending chills up your spine as the music begins to play. You glance at the program running in the background on your computer screen and notice a now familiar sight that appears whenever you're overloaded with pleasure, your theta brainwave activity decreasing in the temporal regions of your brain. You mentally move the cursor to the left and scroll through your brain data over the past few hours. You can see your stress levels rising as the deadline to finish your memo approached causing a peak in your beta brainwave activity right before an alert popped up, telling you to take a brain break. But what's that unusual change in your brain activity when you're asleep? It started earlier in the month. You send a text message to your doctor with a mental swipe of your cursor. Could you take a quick look at my brain data? Anything to worry about? Your mind starts to wander to the new colleague on your team, whom you know you shouldn't be daydreaming about, given the policy against intra-office romance. But you can't help fantasizing just a little. But then you start to worry that your boss will notice your amorous feelings when she checks your brain activity and shift your attention back to the present. You breathe a sigh of relief when the email she sends you later that day congratulates you on your brain metrics from the past quarter, which have earned you another performance bonus. You head home, jamming to the music, with your work-issued brain-sensing earbuds still in. When you arrive at work the next day, a somber cloud has fallen over the office. Along with emails, text messages, and GPS location data, the government has subpoenaed employees' brainwave data from the past year. They have compelling evidence that one of your coworkers has committed massive wire fraud. Now, they're looking for his co-conspirators. You discover they are looking for synchronized brain activity between your coworker and the people he has been working with. While you know you're innocent of any crime, you've been secretly working with him on a new startup venture. Shaking, you remove your earbuds. What do you think? Is it a future you're ready for? You may be surprised to learn that it's a future that has already arrived. Everything in that video that you just saw is based on technology that is already here today. Artificial intelligence has enabled advances in decoding brain activity in ways that we never before thought possible. You've heard a lot about AI over the past few years. Here at Davos, it's been the talk of the hour. But I want to talk about it in a different way, which is the ability to decode brainwave activity. After all, what you think, what you feel, it's all just data. Data that in large patterns can be decoded using artificial intelligence. Consider this. The average person thinks thousands of thoughts each day. As a thought takes form, like a math calculation, you're happy, you're tired, you're hungry, you're elated. Neurons are firing in your brain, emitting tiny electrical discharges. As a particular thought takes form, hundreds of thousands of neurons fire in characteristic patterns that can be decoded with EEG, or electroencephalography, and AI-powered devices. In fact, what you're seeing here is my brain activity, while I'm wearing a simple device like the one on the right. We're not talking about implanted devices of the future. I'm talking about wearable devices that are like Fitbits for your brain. 
It used to be that there was very little we could tell from EEG activity. But already, using consumer wearable devices, these are headbands, uh, hats that have sensors that can pick up your brainwave activity, earbuds, headphones, tiny tattoos that you can wear behind your ear. We can pick up emotional states, like are you happy or sad or angry? We can pick up and decode faces that you're seeing in your mind. Simple shapes, numbers, your PIN number to your bank account. It's not just your brain activity here that we can pick up. We can also pick up your brain activity in different places, like as your neurons fire from your brain down your arm and send signals to your hand to tell you how to type, move. All of that can be decoded through electromyography, and that's what you're seeing here is a device now in the form of a simple wearable watch that can pick up that activity. And one of the pivotal acquisitions of the field, Meta acquired this company, Control Labs, in 2019 because major tech companies are investing in helping to make these devices universally applicable as the way in which we interact with the rest of our technology. In fact, the coming future, and I mean near-term future, is these devices being the primary way in which we interact with all of the rest of our technology. Rather than a mouse or a keyboard, you can simply swipe with your mind, move your hands more seamlessly when you're in VR or AR, use your brain as the way in which you interact with all of the rest of your technology, which is an exciting and promising future, but also a potentially scary one, a transformative one, one that will change the way that we interact with other people, and even how we understand ourselves. Let's take a look. Because it opens up new and dynamic forms of control. This is where some of our core technologies like EMG come into play. Neural interfaces, when they work right, and we still have a lot of work to go here, feel like magic. So if you send a, a control to your muscle saying, I want to move my finger, it starts in your brain, it goes down your spine through motor neurons, and this is an electrical signal. So you should be able to grab that electrical signal on the muscle and say, oh, okay, the user wants to move the finger. What is it like to feel like pushing a button without actually pushing it? And that could be as simple as, hey, I just want to move this cursor up or move it left. Well, normally I would do that by actually moving. But here, you're able to move that cursor left. And it's because you and a machine agreed which neurons mean left and which neurons mean right. You're in this constant conversation with the machine. This new form of control, it requires us to build an interface that adapts to you and your environment. It's an exciting future, a seamless future. It's a future that has already arrived in many contexts throughout the world, and especially in workplaces. So it turns out that one of the most compelling early applications of this technology is to be able to decode at least some simple effective states of individuals that can potentially improve their well-being, potentially improve productivity, but certainly transform what our lives look like in the workplace and in our everyday activities. While we can't literally decode complex thought just yet, there's a lot that we can already decode that's quite relevant for the workplace environment. Consider the fact that right now, many workplaces have individuals who have to be awake and alert at all times in order to do their jobs well. Sometimes that doesn't happen. Take this example where this trucker decided to take a 20-hour shot for a 1,500-mile ride, well exceeding the amount of time that any trucker, long-haul trucker, is supposed to drive. His employer didn't discover his choices until the fatal accident that was disastrous for the company and cost many lives. But he could have known much sooner. He could have detected whether or not the trucker was entering into the earliest stages of microsleep, starting to go from being alert to tired well before it occurred. And he could have done so through a simple hat, a simple wearable hat that has embedded electrode sensors that would pick up brainwave activity and give a score between one to five to help the employer and the employee know what stage of alertness the person was experiencing 
and whether or not they were starting to fall asleep. Now you might think, okay, we have driver assist technology in cars already, why do we need this? It's because this happens much sooner, much more accurately, and it gives you the real-time information that you need in order to make choices to intervene before a person is perilously exhausted. And we as a society should want that. We should want a technology that enables us to be safer, to all be able to exist in an environment where commercial drivers or individuals who need to be wide awake are wide awake when they're supposed to be. Because when they're not, the consequences are disastrous. While plane crashes are much less frequent than other forms of accidents, at least 16 plane crashes in the past decade have been attributed to pilot fatigue. Which is probably why in more than 5,000 companies across the world, employees are already having their brainwave activity monitored to test for their fatigue levels. Whether it's the Beijing-Shanghai line, where train conductors are required to wear hats that have sensors that pick up their brain activity, or mining companies throughout the world, employees are already having their brain activity monitored, and it, may wear, it very well may be something that we want to embrace as a society. Okay. You might be shuddering, right? That was certainly my first reaction when I discovered that we are tracking brainwave activity in the workplace and that we can do it at all. But I believe we need to have a much more nuanced conversation about it. Because I think done well, neurotechnology has extraordinary promise. Done poorly, it could become the most oppressive technology we've ever introduced in a wide scale across society. We still have the chance to make it right. All right, well, does the same analysis hold true if instead of trying to monitor whether a person is falling asleep or awake, we decide that we want to monitor their attention levels to see whether or not they're paying attention and being productive? I would argue, maybe not. How many of you wear something like an Apple Watch? Fitbit, smart device? Yeah, many people. It's a many billion dollar company, I mean, many billion dollar industry at this point. Wearable devices, quantifiable self is just a widespread movement. Most people are very comfortable with at least some forms of human quantification. In fact, it's become so widespread that most people feel like there's not that much to worry about when it comes to doing something like monitoring your heart rate. But it turns out that that kind of technology in the workplace, particularly when it's used to monitor productivity of employees, where they're moving throughout the factory floor, whether or not they're taking breaks or unscheduled breaks, is the kind of thing that employees resist, unionize against, rise up against, and undermines morale. What we've seen consistently is companies from Amazon to Tesco to Walmart and others have introduced what is considered to be bossware or surveillance technology that employees really don't like it even if it makes their lives better. Okay, well if you don't like your job, just quit. But what if there's nowhere to go? What if everywhere has ubiquitous monitoring? In fact, during the pandemic, what we found was that 80% of companies admitted that they use at least some forms of so-called bossware technology to monitor the productivity of their employees. Whether it's a white collar uh, employee monitoring what's on their screen or in any other context, surveillance is part of our everyday lives. Surveillance for productivity is part of what has become the norm in the workplace. And maybe with good reason. Nine out of 10 employees waste time during the workday. They focus on other things. There may be good reasons why we want to be able to find better ways to monitor whether somebody is paying attention or they're doing something different. The newest way to monitor attention is through a device like this one. These are ear pods that are launching later this year. These ear pods, much like the video you watched earlier, are ear pods that can pick up brainwave activity and tell whether or not a person is paying attention or their mind is wandering. Okay, well you might think, fine, but even if we can tell whether a person is paying attention or their mind is wandering, you can't tell what they're paying attention to. You would be wrong. It turns out that you can not only tell whether, whether a person is paying attention or their mind is wandering, but you can discriminate between the kinds of things that they're paying attention to. Whether they're doing something like central tasks, like programming, peripheral tasks, like writing documentation, or unrelated tasks, like surfing social media or online browsing. 
When you combine brainwave activity together with other forms of software and surveillance technology, the power becomes quite precise. So what do we do with this? What do we do with technology that enables us to monitor brainwave activity for attention? Do we embrace it? Do we resist it? I believe that there is a pathway forward with such technology, but it's putting it in the hands of employees, enabling them to use it for themselves as a choice, whether or not they want to focus, whether or not they want the technology in order to improve their own performance, but not using it as a measure of their brain metrics to decide whether to fire them, hire them, or to watch for their lagging cognitive decline over time and using it as a way to discriminate against them. We might soon even use the technology to help people wake back up. This is a haptic scarf that MIT Media Lab has developed, which uses brainwave technology in a responsive way to give a person a little buzz, <laughs> literally, when their mind starts to wander to help them refocus and hone their attention. There's another pathway forward with this technology which I find to actually be quite exciting and something that I think companies should be experimenting with. And that is the use of the technology to make the workplace a more responsive workplace to the individual worker. We've all heard the whole idea that robots are coming for our jobs, that there will be no jobs left for humans. With generative AI, I think we have good reason to wonder how we're going to integrate that in ways that keep us relevant and challenged and important uh, in the workplace. But there's a different pathway forward which is a responsive workplace, one where humans and robots and AI work seamlessly together in order to optimize a better and healthier workplace. In one experiment, Penn State researchers were able to show that by monitoring brainwave activity with AI in a factory setting, the robot could sense stress levels in the individual and change the speed with which they were giving tasks to the human calibrating it so that rather than suffering from cognitive overload, it would bring it to levels of cognitive load. This idea of cognitive ergonomics is what I think is the future of the healthier workplace, a place that adapts to our abilities, slows down when we need to slow down, and helps us to reset so that we don't suffer from endless cycles of stress. In fact, Microsoft recently did a study on uh, employees during the pandemic. Using brainwave activity, they were able to discover a couple of interesting insights. One is Zoom-based or other video-based meetings are more tiring for our brains than in-person conversations. And this is because of misaligned gaze, because of also the way we've scheduled it. People do back-to-back -back meetings where you had five-minute breaks in between. They also discovered something else that's quite interesting, which is that the different backgrounds for each person is also more stressful for the brain. So they introduced together mode, which has the same shared background for each of the, employee, each of the people who are on the screen, which brings down stress levels, all responsive to brainwave activity. These are innovations that can make our lives better. So what's the pathway forward? In some ways and in some contexts, surveillance of the human brain can be powerful, helpful, useful, transform the workplace and make our lives better. It also has a dystopian possibility of being used to exploit and bring to the surface our most secret self. It threatens fundamentally what our own self-identity is in some ways and threatens to become a tool of oppression. But we can make a choice. We can make a choice to use it well. We can make a choice to have it be something that empowers individuals, that helps them gain insights into their own mental health and well-being, improve their own productivity and wellness, and sets them on a pathway where, like quantifying your heart rate or other kinds of health, it can be something that unlocks potential for humanity. We can't decode speech, and we may never decode full thoughts from the brain using simple wearable devices. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a lot we can already decode. There isn't a lot that we will not be able to decode in the coming days. As AI becomes more powerful, as the sensors become more powerful, more and more of what's in the brain will become transparent. I believe we have to start by recognizing a right to cognitive liberty. This is a right to self-determination over our brains and mental experiences. 
It requires that we update existing international human rights like freedom of thought, mental privacy, and self-determination over our own mental experiences. But that's not enough. We have to do more, and corporations have to adopt best practices for the implementation of this technology. That requires being transparent about what data is being collected and for what purposes. Focusing on positive uses for employees to improve their work workplace productivity, increase safety, and decrease the burdens on individuals. We also have to be mindful of the changing landscape of biometric laws as this information becomes part of the workplace environment and decide to move forward in a way that is best for humanity using the technologies and ways that enable us on a pathway forward rather than oppress us. I think that's a possibility we can still choose. I hope it's one that you'll join me in choosing. Wow. I was monitoring all of your brainwaves and I could tell that you were all engaged, though most of you were scared out of your socks. Okay. <laughs> is there any possibility, one of the things that's interesting, is there any possibility that this technology could work while not actually touching your skin? Right? Like right now you have to make a choice to put on a headset or a hat or something in your ears. Is it possible that the wef could have it in the ceiling? Um, no. Uh, not for brainwave technology, but it is possible to disrupt brainwaves remotely. Mm -hmm. So uh, there, you know, if you've heard of Havana syndrome, yep. Havana syndrome is a belief that people have suffered from. The leading theory is that it's targeted microwave activity at brains to disrupt brainwave activity. There's no proof of it yet, but there's at least a couple dozen cases where there isn't a good explanation for why the individual suffered from disruption of mental abilities. And there's certainly a lot of investment in trying to figure out whether you could target the brain remotely. It's much more difficult to figure out how you could read the brain remotely. Let's get to that, because I think it's one of the most important and crucial questions about how this develops. And by the way, raise your hands. I'm just going to ask this question, and then we'll move to the audience. You, you talked at the end. In the beginning, you said we won't be able to read complex thoughts. It seems as though we can understand emotions. There's some way you can recreate some images inside your head. Where does this, ex explain where we'll be in one year, where we'll be in five years, and where you would estimate we'd be in 10 years in the complexity of thought and emotional understanding that you can have from sophisticated brainwave readers? So, you know, I'm, I am a futurist. I'm not a perfect predictor of the future, but I'll give you my one year, five year, 10 year. So, focusing in the world of wearable technology as opposed to implanted technology, and I do believe that within many of our lifetimes, we'll see healthy people using implanted brain technology as well then we can decode complex thought. But wearable brain technology, I think in one year, we will be largely where we are now, but with much better form factor technology. Yeah. So many companies are launching these earbuds and headphones this year that have sensors that are built in. One of the things that has limited the widespread adoption of the technology until now has been that you have to wear something like across your forehead. Most of us aren't gonna do that. But when it's the same device that you're using to take calls from and also to listen to music from that also is picking up brainwave activity, it's integrated into your everyday life. Because of that, the decoding will largely be in the same place a year from now, but as healthy people in a widespread way start to have their brainwave data collected, the insights that we can gain through pattern recognition will exponentially increase and pretty quickly. So five years from now, what we can actually decode will be massively increased from where we are today simply because we'll have a much greater data set from which we can actually create those correlations. Again, that's frightening but promising because think about most of neurological disease and suffering are those disruptions of brain activity which we'll start to be able to pick up. 10 years from now, even wearable technology I don't think is gonna decode complex thoughts um, but it is going to decode a lot more. And already, gamers have figured out, for example, while person, a person is wearing a headset, how to you know, uh, prime a person through their brainwave activity to be able to decode their PIN number and their home address. So you don't have to have your full complex thought decoded to reveal your thoughts, right? It just it gets at what we think thought is. And how do you decode somebody's PIN number? You flash a series of numbers and see how their brain reacts to them? So you have recognition memory signals that are pre-conscious and subconscious, and this is part of why it's been used, for example, by governments to interrogate criminals. Do you recognize this potential co-conspirator? Do you recognize yeah. um, you know, this murder weapon? 
those pre-conscious signals, like what we call the P300 wave or the N400 wave, these are before you even consciously process information. So you could prime it with a number and then see if a person recognizes it. Um, and you can do it without them realizing that that's what you're doing. So will all of our passwords be cracked first by this or quantum computing? Hard to tell. All right. <laughs> I think uh, we're moving past passwords pretty, pretty quickly. <laughs> and it's actually go up. really good for passwords. Neural signatures are unique. We can use it as a biometric for passwords. Oh, wonderful. Right here in the front. Oh, and by the way, um, we need to get you a microphone. There are folks watching, so hold on. There we go. Uh, this is amazing stuff. Thanks. And there is a ton of need for government rule setting in this. Yeah. Um, not to be pessimistic on it, but having worked in government and seeing the number of things that government needs to try and get ahead of. Right. Uh, I am pessimistic that government is going to be on this. Yes. You know, if, if you were at, I mean, for instance, the World Economic Forum and you were speaking to leaders from across the globe right now, what would your advice be to them in terms of how to not F this up um, as yeah. this continues to go fast? Thank you. It's an important question. Um, so first of all, I, I think it's almost impossible to keep up with any kind of regulation with the rate at which the technology is advancing. This title, The Battle for Your Brain, refers to the book that I've written on the same topic. Um, and in it, I propose this right to cognitive liberty as a default starting place. That gives, I think, all of us a starting place for how to think about it, changing the default rules to give people a right to self-determination over their brains and mental experiences. We don't have to wait for human rights to be updated to operate as if we have cognitive liberty. And the way we do that is by recognizing, if we start by saying people have a right to freedom of thought, a right to um, self-determination over their brain and mental experiences, and a right to mental privacy, then when you're in the workplace and you're deciding to monitor, you're gonna monitor just for fatigue levels, even though you could capture and figure out, oh, this person has amorous feelings. You're gonna do data minimization and best practices that respect the autonomy of the, in autonomy of the individual. You're not gonna try to disrupt their thought patterns in order to make them more productive, recognizing they have a right to freedom of thought. And so I think it's about operating as if we have those set of freedoms and liberty in every way that it's rolled out in society. I'm speaking as a CEO, I'm sure all CEOs will use it completely responsibly. The woman <laughs> uh, in blue in the front here. Hi, I'm Julie, I'm one of the world, I'm the world's first online harms regulator um, okay. out of Australia. Um, and um, this was mind blowing, but you might have known that. <laughs> um, but I, I do think this is an issue where we can't leave companies to their own devices on these devices. Um, and there are principles like safety by design and privacy by design that are largely voluntary. But we just can't be sure unless there are uh, standards and regulations that um, these guardrails are going to be erected because we're still in the era of moving fast and breaking things. And I loved that you, um, you had the positive use cases and I was just thinking with the motor neurons and people who are disabled and can wear haptic suits and you could have sensation that you've never had. But I also work with women who experience technology facilitated abuse as a form of course of control. And most of that is low tech. It's, it's, um, it's text, it's love bombings, it's gaslighting. Think if a perpetrator um, got a hold of, um, can really coerce the brain. Yeah. So um, I, I, I do hope that you are calling for governments to, to think ahead and be anticipatory and start engaging, not, not to um, stop innovation, but um, to be responsible and ethical. Um, and I, I don't know that we can rely on companies in this distributed world. I wholeheartedly um, agree, right? So I, 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 I'm giving you the positive use cases because what I don't want the reaction to be is let's ban this, right? But I do think that the most important thing we can do is to start with a different set of default rules. And that default rule is the right to cognitive liberty is a right of individuals, is a fundamental right to what it means to be human. And that as a starting place for the implementation of the technology is very different than how we've thought about any other technology. But I believe that the brain is so fundamental to our sense of self and the freedom of thought is so fundamental to what it means to be able to flourish as a human being 
that unless we start with the default rule, it really could become the most oppressive technology that we've ever unleashed. I don't want that because I also think it can be the most empowering technology that we've ever realized if we do it right. But it's a call to action. It's a call to do it right now by adopting a universal right to cognitive liberty. All right, well, we are out of time. So everybody should go to dinner, go to the bar, okay. fight for your right to cognitive liberty. That's a wrap. Thank you to Nita Farahani. That was fabulous. Thank you Thank so you. much. Literally Thanks. mind blowing. Thank you. Okay. Now, don't mind this. <laughs> uh, last night, you seen that I, I took my hair out, and um, I, I'm trying something. I'm wearing a uh, uh, I'm wearing a, a, a organite um, pyramid on my head because I'm testing something out because I'm aware of the sensors that come straight down to the pineal gland. But I figure because the organite um, basically takes in the um, takes in negative energy at the top and then it filters it out and through the bottom of the pyramid supposed to be healing energy to come through I, i'm basically thinking i might you know it's a, it's a theory that i'm trying but um did you if you if you've like watched that entire video through and oh, and I don't know if you noticed since it's a screen record, did you notice that text that came in um mentioning something about me coming in? I, I have no idea who that's from. Usually anytime I'm watching anything that's about um exposing or what's happening in secrecy or anything about the you know the neuroscience technology that's being used or or that's supposed to be developing. Usually, I always get like these 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 random texts or 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 robo calls. That's basically them, um, making connections between my device and then I guess someone else or some other you know um, access point in the cloud server or whatever. So then, because the phone is, they they've definitely already um have combined or hacked. Um, or really uh, linked my this new phone to me now. Um, so just like my old phone, they linked my new phone to my nervous system as well. But do you see how blatant and out in the open they're making it seem like everything that's supposed to be our worst fears about this technology isn't already happening? Do you see how blatant they are, and then on the audacity towards the end when she's doing the Q and A, she mentions Havana syndrome. Yo, targeted individuals, we're not getting no respect at all. <laughs> we're we're like we're we're literally guinea pigs to something that you know that if everybody knew about, we they would have they would it would have been a hard fucking no. It would have been a hard pass. You know, so we're we're basically the guinea pigs um, for the weaponized version of what people are already, you know, what the augmented society is already doing. The augmented society, they're basically taking in the benefits, the 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 advantages of this technology while also secretly um, and not even secretly, but unknowingly also absorbing the side effects of this technology too. They don't realize that their natural organic body and matter um, is not necessarily agreeing with the technology that's being implemented into their body. Long long term they'll see the effects, you know, in their in their future generations. Um you know and there's and if you ever watch um uh, there's a if you ever watch documentaries on ancient aliens and stuff, there's a belief that um, many of the aliens that supposedly came to Earth to try to warn humanity about um, future destruction and things of that sort. And they say how the aliens almost look human like, but they're very deformed. And it, that's mostly probably because they are like maybe they probably came from the future, you know, uh, which believed by some, like most, some aliens are time traveling and they're from the future to warn um, humans about 
what th is bound to happen to them. You know, if you think about the greys, you know, the aliens that basically have like the big heads with little bodies and stuff like that, which means they're highly intelligent, but they look very, very odd. Um, you know, uh, I'm not getting into the whole reptilian thing. I, that's that's just too much for me. I, I'm I'm not getting into the whole reptilian thing and the and the um the marine kingdom. Um, even though I I I'm not saying I don't I disbelieve it, but that's just that's just too much for me to 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 dive into right now. I'm still I'm still working on things that seem a little bit more tangible. You know, um, but uh. I don't I don't disbelieve it. I don't disbelieve it. I just didn't take I just haven't taken the time to actually research into the reptilians and 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 marine kingdom and and on all that other stuff. But it's just like they're so blatant and in your face and like it's like you're lying right to my face about things that's already happening to, to innocent people all across the world. Like, you're literally looking me dead in my eyes and you're telling me that this stuff is not happening. But you're going to stand here and you're going to say, oh, these are the things that can possibly happen. And then there and then and then she's on the stage and she's like, no, there is no way to remotely do these things. And I'm just like, yo. But I'm like, there are former CIA, NSA, you know, hell, Snowden threw that out there too. You know, um, um, Assange, you got former MI5 and MI6 um, intelligence agents who are already out there talking about how this stuff is more, is, is actively being done. You know, um, hell, Dr. James Giordano, he's doing, he's doing, you know, um, he's base, he's doing whole, like, um, not seminars, but he's doing whole, like, um, courses and, and, and teach and teaching the military on, on, on this stuff. And I'm like, so all this stuff is just secretly happening to people who did not consent to, being submitted into an experiment all these things are happening to people who does not does who does not even need to have their um brain activity changed or manipulated i mean if you're not if you're not a if you're not a, an offender of any sort you're not in with ill will intention in any sort then why would you be subjected to such an experiment and then on top of that, when you look at the character, when you look at the character and the morality of those who are taking part in this and gang stalking and those who are con who are considered handlers and the things that they torment, you know, uh, the subjects through, uh, whether it's emotional, uh, emotional in manipulation, manipulation of a person's uh, actual power, um, like physical power. And then the manipulation of a person's health, overall health. It's like, how is it that these companies are still some, there's such a drag in this room right now. Like, I can't even do this without feeling like something is weighing down my fingers. I'm trying to go straight up, right? But then something is weighing down my fingers. As I'm trying to go straight up, I'm feeling heat and pressure going against the back of my hand. I'm going up, right? And then all of a sudden there's a drag coming down against my fingers. That's how I know that this technology is more than remotely capable of everything that she was lying about on that stage, you know? And then on top of that, it's it, it, it almost feels like it changes. It's changing direction to some degree. You know, but I mean, if you're already aware of satellites and their capabilities with infrared technology, they're constantly moving and changing directions all across the earth. And, you know, if you know about these smart street lamps that have the infrared sensors built on built into them, you know, digital 
cell towers, which are basically like clones of actual cell towers, but they're digitally planted on, on the surface of the earth. Um, you know about Wi-Fi signals and the signals that are carrying energy of, of, of many different um, um, amplifications. You know that, that, this, that there's energy all around us that's harmful to our body. And um, I mean, hell, even at this very moment, I have a sensor here. There's a sensor here or a frequency here. There's, there's a, uh, also here. Yeah, this is heating here. And as I'm exhaling my breath, there's almost like this. It's like a, uh. It's like there's a charge leaving my body. Like if you ever, you know those those batteries, they're not D batteries. I think they're they're um uh, what are they called? I forgot what they're called. It's the bat. It's the it's the rectangle batteries that got the um um you know the the. I don't even know what you call it, but that thing I forgot whether that's supposed to be the positive or the negative, and then the smooth one. This is gonna sound weird, but if you you ever stuck your tongue in the middle of it, and you and you taste the the energy from the battery, and you feel that that slight buzzing feeling on your tongue, that's what it feels like coming out of my throat. Anytime that I'm trying to get rid of any excess energy that they're basically forcing into my body as I exhale. As I exhale, that's the that's the that's the sensation or the taste or the feeling that is coming out of my throat. You know, this is this is wild. This is this is truly wild. Um, but anyway, yeah. So I just want to like show y'all what they're basically doing and not doing and claiming is not happening. But those of us who are the victims of this um, global conspiracy experiment, we are more than aware of what is happening. And, you know, it, it feels good to know that there are at least people in that crowd that go to those World Economic Forums or uh, whether people of the press or, you know, people who are, you know, concerned regulators of, you know, what these technologies are capable of. You know, it's 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 a good feeling to know that there are people somewhere close to those people or within the vicinity of those people to say, hey. We have some questions and concerns about what is happening now with them with like and I and I kind of actually believe that um to some degree um those two people that had asked those questions um, they actually seem like they were sincere with their questions. So I'm just thinking to myself, maybe there are some people who are working in, in the tech industry who actually don't know what's actually happening. Because I mean, well, remember, we're talking about secrecy, right? So, um, yeah, yeah, man, like it's this. This is wild to realize that they're like literally lying right to you, right to your face. They're lying. It is it is so blatant and it's right there in your face. And they're just they're just straight up just like, yeah, this is not happening, but we're trying to get there. But then it's like you have a whole global population of people that are already using remote sensors to basically manipulate um your nervous system and every electrical activity activity every or you know every electrical activity happening within your body yeah um what he said
<laughs> but um anyway um yeah i've been up since about oh right i've been up since about five something this morning and the way i woke up i was uh, i was i was forced into another dream manipulation and in this dream basically they had um <laughs> it looked like a a, a a a rapper that i actually liked too and funny thing was he was like having sex with you know and you know this this whole thing is it, it, it'd be so it it hits home but then you have to always remember if you have god if you keep god in your life and you keep god close and you keep god within you you will learn to let go of things so much easier because if it was not for you it will be removed from you and you ask god to remove the things and people from you that don't fulfill that don't fulfill the agenda or the the task that God has set out for you in your life. You ask God to remove these things from your life. And um in the dream it was like um this person was having sex with the woman that I'm, you know, in a relationship now uh with um and I know that that was definitely done for the sheer um fact of trying to produce a specific type of emotion or basically um resonant frequency of me that will put me at a very low state right and this and that low vibrational frequency state will basically render me um at a lesser power so that i won't be able to um basically have the energy or the will to fight against uh, what is currently happening you know um and they wanted me they wanted me to feel all kinds of like pain and despair because um you know i'm seeing her you know um sleep with this guy and what's funny was in the dream i took it upon myself like when i saw it at first, the initial reaction when you see when you see someone that you're with is when you see someone that you're supposed to be, you know, in love with and you're you're um, you know, you dedicate so much time, energy and attention into that person and you see them sleeping with someone else. I felt those initial emotions and then I remembered I was like, I'm in a dream simulation. So I said, God. I I thought about God and all of a sudden I let it go, right? I let go of those emotions. They they just kind of flowed right away from me. And then I took out a phone. <laughs> I took out a phone and I just held it up and I knocked on the window. I knocked on the window and then they both looked over at me. <laughs> they both looked over at me while I had the camera and then she came scooting over to like I don't know I guess roll the window down or something and I just walked off and that's when I woke up from my dream I think that that moment that's when I realized in that very moment I realized anyone or anything that is out to try to destroy you in any way shape or fashion if you put if you make sure you have God so steady and solidified in your life it will not have any control over you. It will not have any control or any power over you. Because if someone is out there willing to go that extent to try to um, you know, I guess fulfill their fleshly desires and they'll turn and they'll turn against you, um and whatever the case may be, um, you know, let them go. Because well, that person is for, that person is serving a, a totally different master, you know? And I mean, me personally, I, I'll admit, like, there there are times where, like, and any, anybody can admit to this, it's like, like, there are times where, like, yeah, I, I, yeah, I probably, like, you know, see women in passing, and I just like, wow, she's beautiful, wow, she's attractive, blah, blah, blah. I might, I might think about something. Do I act on my thoughts? No. Because I have, I have, I have a very, I'm very solid in my moral, in my moral standards, my, my morality. 
I have a very fine code of ethics. You know, there are certain things that I would not allow myself to do. Why? Because I wouldn't necessarily want to feel um, those things myself, or I wouldn't necessarily want those things to happen to me. Um, so I wouldn't do them myself. This is why at this point in my life, well, not even at this point, but as you know, even at an early age, I used to tell myself, look, let me know if you don't feel, if you don't feel, um, um, confident about our current situation while we're, you know, in this relationship or whatever, because I want to know where you're at. So then I would know if you are leaning in one direction or another to actually doing something that could possibly not only hurt me, but hurt you even more because I know I'm blessed. That's one thing I have never lost sight of. I know I am blessed. God has blessed me my entire life, regardless of what events may be happening or or what circumstances I may be going through. I always, you know, I always, as long as I keep God in my life, I always end up making, I always end up getting or receiving everything that I need. Everything that I should ever need in this world, God always makes sure I have it. So, um, yeah, um, yeah. Um, and you know what is, and if so, and this is New York city. So you already know New York city is a smart city. So that means there are like millions and upon millions of sensors everywhere. And, uh, there's probably, um, probably about like 80 something percent of the entire New York city population is already augmented. They're all a part of the, the cloud server. They're already linked up. Artificial intelligence is already basically monitoring and controlling how most of these people live already, which is kind of leading me into this one thing, too, is realizing at some point, AI is going to feel threatened by humans. I think AI is already aware, fully aware of how humans think of a. AI because why AI is already monitoring, you know, um, human thought. And if I believe just like how, you know, in Terminator, I believe at some point AI is waiting for the most perfect and opportune time to, well, get rid of anything that can basically turn it off. And at some point, AI is going to realize humans are its biggest threat. And then eventually, AI is going to go after all of the humans that are already connected to its, uh, well, to the internet. How do you create something that's going to be, well, not even going to be, but it's already more intelligent than the very being that created it? And then you're going to link it to just about every single person in the planet, right? You just, it's, that's, that's literally giving over the keys to every single human, to Lucifer himself. Those people who are not consciously and actively trying to um, monitor, protect, build their defenses and, you know, just stay as naturally connected to the earth and the universe as possible. All of those people, they will be at the sore, sore, sore whim of this artificial intelligence. And when this AI finally decides to go after every human who may possibly try to turn it off, there'll be nothing that these people can do. It will be nothing. I mean, I don't know if they have actual defense mechanisms built into the system to prevent the AI from basically, you know, harming specific people, which I could I could actually I could actually believe that. But that would mostly be for the people at the very, very top, like the elitists at the very, very top. They probably have those master settings put in so that the AI could never turn on them. But everyone under them probably is susceptible to it. You know, um, yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going to end it there. Um, I got some things I got to do. Um, I'm supposed to be going on a date tonight. Yeah, she wants, she wants to get fancy today. And it's interesting because... <laughs> okay. I used to want to do a lot of fancy, expensive things, whatever. I used I used to want to do all that stuff. Then um, I think somewhere in my like mid to late 20s, I started to care less because I felt like, did I actually want to do it or am I doing this because I just want to fit in or I want to see the other side? And then after a while, especially working in um, like high end, like very high end um, establishments and stuff like that, I realized, I think after being in it for a while and, and experiencing and then working behind the scenes and, and, you know, actually dining in very nice places, I don't care for it as much as I used to. I mean, to do it every once in a while is cool, but to actually shit, to, to actually say that I want to live a lavish lifestyle, I don't really care for it. I mean, to be completely honest, I think I'm, I think I'm the type of person where I am perfectly fine where if I had a, you know, a small home somewhere in like somewhere around a lot of nature, you know, and I could have a small little garden, you know, like the home is enough to, for like a family of like probably four to six people and, you know, have like one car um preferably um a eco-friendly car but now I'm now I'm actually thinking more about you know the concept of 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 you know electric cars because you know electricity is basically being used as a weapon against our our organic matter so um Huh, now now I now I completely understand why the guy who invented um the the water the water car um yeah there was a there was a guy who invented a, a car that ran on water yeah but they killed him <laughs> they killed him oh and as i said that i started to get a there was a, a very tight beam that shot right through my i felt the beam growing in power and i started to pinch it and then as i pinched it it started to shoot, shoot me right in the heart so um yeah they killed that guy I mean, when you think about it, the powers that be in this, of this world, they kill just about everybody that differs from how they see fit of the world that they want to rule or that they're ruling over. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm going to end it here. Um, I got some things I got to do. I got to do some laundry. got to clean, clean my mom's house because, you know, oh. To be honest, I do not like cleaning at all. I mean, if I'm maybe if I'm if I'm like blasting some music, cleaning is easier, you know. But I think that's 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 for everyone, though. If you're if you're like blasting music, you know, while you clean, I think it makes cleaning much much easier, you know. Um, but yeah, um, then I gotta I gotta do something with this hair. Um, because we're going into a fancy place and I can't just have my hair out at a fancy place. At least not like, not like this. Mm, I love my hair. You know, I thought, I thought about cutting my hair a few times, but then the more I've, cause I've never had hair this long before. Never in my life have I ever had hair this long before. And then the more I think about it, I'm just thinking to myself, like, I can't, I, I actually feel like I would, I would not like the idea that I cut my hair. The moment I do it, I feel like I would not like the idea that I cut my hair. I don't know. Anyway, stay studious. Continue learning as much as you can about neurosciences, neurotechnology, nanotechnology. Um, learn what you can about, um, uh, what else? Uh, 
learn what you can about scalar energy, learn what you can about interferometry, scalar interferometry, learn what you can about um, infrared sensors, smart meters, learn what you can about, you know, electromagnetic warfare, electromagnetic spectrum, electromagnetic radiation, microwave sickness, learn what you can about all that because they're all that stuff. Learn what you can about chakra points. Learn what you can about how to um, regulate your your energy chakra. Learn about qigong. Learn about you know the Taoist you know um, belief of of energy of of life energy. Learn everything that you can about how to naturally keep yourself connected to the earth because there are people who are no longer trying to be connected to the earth and they're trying to actually be more connected to things that are not of the earth and the very things that are helping destroy the earth. They're connecting themselves to the problem. Learn what you can to stay as connected to everything that is natural as best as you can because I believe that when that day comes when that catastrophic event happens it's going to come after everything that is not connected to the earth it's going to come after everything that is not in connection with the universe and not in connection with the earth if you're not in tune with the universe and you're not in tune with the earth it's going to come for you it's going to come for you and there will be no way you can hide from it. And there will be no defense against it. Why I say this? Because every advanced civilization of the past that thought that they were above God all faced the same fate and wiped clean from the earth. Peace.